Hey guys, welcome to Youth Group. Just like always, right? No, in fact, we all know it's not. I'm in my sunroom right now. You're probably gonna hear strange random noises as I'm trying to record this. You guys are sitting in your house with your headphones in watching a screen. This is odd, right? I feel like I'm George Jetson right now. And this is, you guys probably don't know George Jetson. Anyways, feels like we're living in the future and this is crazy absolute craziness it just very odd and i want to start this and just look at the reality if this is how we're doing ministry for the next 10 weeks to lean in and say this is really hard it's hard to actually lean in it's hard to want to learn from a computer screen it's hard to want to be vulnerable it's hard to actually engage with one another through this technology and yet, I want to lean into it. I want to invite us deeper into it. Acknowledging that it's going to take some getting used to. It's going to take some getting used to me talking to a computer screen for crying out loud. This is weird. Official stance, this is weird. Your small groups are going to feel weird. And yet, I'm inviting you to join me and trying to just figure it out together to lean in and say, there are ways that we can still be the church. We can still do youth group. And it's just going to look really different. So I'm inviting you into the kind of messy laugh at ourselves, figure it out as I was like a goober and all the rest. Um, just for the sake of us continuing to be the church. Cause I truly believe that right now is an incredible opportunity for all of us, whether you believe or you don't believe it's an incredible opportunity because it's forcing us to stop. What the coronavirus has done is laid bare our hearts and ask, what are our lives all about? So if this, this evening you come and you're not a believer, you haven't set your hope on Christ, what the coronavirus gives you the chance to do is ask, what is my hope in? What, what do I think has power in my life, is worth putting faith in? Am I tired of my distractions yet? All right, there's only... So, so long you can look at TikTok or Netflix before you get tired of it. But if you do believe tonight, if tonight you come and you say, I am a believer, the reality is this is an incredible opportunity for you as well. You get to bring those same questions in that I just raised a second ago, but also realize this is a part of our family history. That what we're talking about as we are isolated and sickness shuts everything down is actually nothing new for Christianity. The history of Christianity has many different times when the people were scattered or persecuted or came under huge plagues and problems, such as this one right now. When the plague hit Rome, all the physicians and doctors and everybody fleed except for the Christians. The Christians stayed behind and cared for the sick, often dying even with them. But what it gave them was this incredible witness. Thousands came to faith because they saw how a Christian reacted in crisis. I'm going to argue that for us, we get to lean into what does it look like for us to wear our faith, even in the midst of isolation. It also gives us a ton of time to actually just grow in our faith. So often we, we let things such as our own busyness, sports schedules, hanging out with friends, homework, all the rest, just like raise up as examples and reasons why I can't read the Bible, why I can't pray. Well, guys, we got lots of time now, lots and lots of time on our hands. And that's not meant to shame. It's meant to say, what a great opportunity that we get to spend some of that time in the word, that we get to learn a little bit more about who God is, that we get to sit in the beauty of Christ, perhaps even every day. And what's really cool is that we live in this age when we have this technology to keep connected with one another. You know, so often if this would come, you know, a couple hundred years ago, even just a couple decades ago, even like we wouldn't have had the, the opportunity to do a, a live stream small group together with one another. So I encourage you um, to use things such as social media, Marco Polo, all the rest, Zoom, to actually check in on people. Not just being silly, not just doing the next dance on TikTok, but actually checking and seeing, hey, how are you? You frustrated. What, what's going on in your house? Are you bored yet? I'm about ready to kick my parents out. This is crazy. There's plenty of things that we can do as the church right now that are incredible opportunities given to us by this coronavirus. So what we're going to do tonight is just continue on in our study, right? So we're on 
Week four, uh, we're looking at adoption this week of looking at gospel identity. Who are we? What does the gospel have for us? Um, two weeks ago, we talked about justification by faith. If you'll remember what we talked about, is this reality that Christ saw us in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, that we couldn't be in communication or in relationship with God because of our sin. And Christ came down and through his death and resurrection, clothed us in his righteousness. If you remember, we did the thing with the robe in which we saw that what Jesus does is put his kingly robe over us. So when God looks at us, he sees Christ's holiness instead of our sinfulness. And that allows us to be in con connection and communion with God. This week, we're going to see how adoption draws us into something bigger. How adoption actually draws us into a deeper love because it's drawing us into family. And I think that adoption is vitally important to us right now. Because adoption reminds us of two things. It reminds us of our connection with God and our connection with one another. It invites us to look and see that we're a part of a bigger family. And so I, I think so often we think of our faith just very individualistically, right? I invited Jesus into my heart. And while we readily admit that everyone has a personal faith, what we miss when we say that is the reality that like when we believe in Christ, He's actually inviting us into his heart. It's not about this just like solo faith, just me and Jesus. It's when we believe in Jesus, we're drawn into a family that spans not just the globe, but also time. This is our great hope. This is what adoption draws us into, this reality that God is drawing orphans into his family, that we get to lean into love, to connection, and to relationship. So let's pray, and then we'll get into the word together. Father, I'm thankful for the ways in which you allow us to meet, even when we're separated, uh, even when we're just in our own living rooms or, or whatever room we're out in our house, we're still together as your church. God, I ask that your spirit would come and bless the this time, that he would help us to just laugh at ourselves where we need to and draw us tight into your word to see just the incredible beauty that you offer to us in Christ as adopted sons and daughters. Lift us up in Christ's name. Amen. So this evening, we are going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4. And hopefully you're seeing it on your screen right now. Uh, I can share screens. So this is our passage for tonight. It says this. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, also, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this passage is incredible. It's one that like really unlocks and shows forth the beauty of adoption. But I think we're being honest, there's a bit of a problem from the outset. I think the problem so often for us when we think about adoption is none of us think of ourselves as orphans. None of us think of ourselves as needing a family. None of us think of ourselves for sure as enslaved. And yet, that's exactly how Paul says we were in our sin. In our sin, we're enslaved. Verse 3 is, is really explicit about this. That when we were under the law, the law condemned us because we were unable to be perfect. We couldn't remain holy. And we were enslaved to it. And think about that language. We were enslaved to our sins. What that means is we have no rights. We have no hope. We have no ability to change the reality around us, right? We were dead in our sins like we studied in Ephesians. But here's what's crazy. And what this passage really opens up for is this reality that God wasn't content to leave it that way. God wasn't content to just say, okay, this is how it is and nothing's going to change. What adoption shows us is that God moves towards us and says, come be a part of my family. I think one of my favorite ways I've ever seen this is, is through this illustration, and I have some helpers here who are going to help me actually 
show this forth to y'all. Um, so I'm going to invite you to imagine with me that there is an imaginary kingdom. We're going to call it the kingdom of Sunroom because that's where we are. Uh, and in this kingdom, there was a peasant. And the peasant, day by day, just went and worked the crops and wondered and wondered where his meals were going to come from and wondered if anything would ever change and settled down into the dreary, sad life of a peasant. But then something incredible happened. One day the king came down to look about in his land and saw the peasant and then did something incredible. The king told him to put on a crown that he actually didn't have to work the ground anymore because from now on, he's going to be his son and he'll be loved for forever. He said, you're with me now. Yay. Good work boys. Um, but while, while it's maybe easy to just laugh at that and say, okay, Clay, we understand what adoption is. That's actually an incredible picture of exactly what happens to us when we believe in Christ. What the gospel shows forth is this reality that we, like that peasant, had no hope. We had nothing to offer. And the King of Kings, God himself sent his son to come and make us his sons and daughters. He changed everything. He invites us into his family. And think about that. Think about, again, use this illustration, right? This reality that that peasant just went from one who didn't know where his next meal was coming from to royalty. To royalty. He's a part of the royal family now, right? He was in threadbare clothes, and now he's going to be in the finest clothes the kingdom has to offer. And also, he's been given power, right? I mean, think about it. If a king were to say, somebody get me a horse. Three different people probably running off to get the horse. If a peasant said, somebody give me a horse, everybody looked at him like he's crazy, like, your words have no power here. And yet, those peasants' words have been transformed by the king now, because the king made him an adopted son. And so now, when the peasant speaks, he's able to bring forth power. When we have faith, we're able to speak the words of the Spirit, that we have the scriptures themselves, this power that's given to us by God. Not just that. Remember, in the illustration, the peasant wasn't offered a, a, just like a position, right? He wasn't just like, hey, just come work over here. No, he's invited into family. He's invited into love. He's invited into coming and being in the warmth of a family. And that's crazy. That's awesome. That would change everything, right? Because then the peasant's going to go back and tell his friends, like, you're never going to believe this. You're never going to believe this. The king made me his son, right? What it does is unleashes us unto mission. When we see God as a loving father coming through Christ, making us his sons and daughters, we get to tell people about it. We get to tell our friends about, man, Jesus changed my life. I believe in the one who's going to give me eternal life for forever. And it's awesome and beautiful and worth it. But it also has this responsibility, right? Kind of like we talked about earlier. If I'm bearing a family name, I better know my family. I better know who I am, who I'm a part of. And that's what's so beautiful about the scriptures that God says, come and learn about who I am as your father. Come and see my love poured out again and again. Come and see how Christ has made you able to come be a part of my family. Again, we have tons of time to do that right now. It's an incredible opportunity to lean into the word and into prayer right now. But he also invites us, there's a responsibility to know our family around us. It connects us, again, remember, to God and to others. We need to know the other people in our youth group. That's part of our family. We need to know the other people in Trinity, even the old fogies that sit in the back. We need to know them because they're family. I use familial language all the time. I call people brother and sister a lot. And it's because someone once told me, remember who you're talking to. You're talking to family when you talk to people. You're talking to those who you should call brother and sister and love them as such. It draws us into community which is such a beautiful word as we're all locked in our own houses. That's the hope. I mean, this is so incredible. What's so beautiful about adoption is that it shows that the son of God came and made us sons and daughters 
of God himself. This is our hope. Christ comes and makes us a part of his family. Some of you know my story, that neither one of my parents were believers, my grandparents either. Um, And so I grew up in the Bible Belt, never going to church. Sunday was always my least favorite day of the week because then none of my friends could play with me. It ended up being chore day, which was the worst. And so to me, the doctrine of adoption is sweeter than honey because in it, it shows, Clay, you are drawn into a family that encompasses every tribe, tongue, and nation. Bigger than yourself, bigger than your own last name, you are drawn into Christ's family because of his love. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what adoption's all about. So, brothers and sisters, you know, as you're feeling isolated and alone, remember how the gospel connects us to God and to one another. As you're feeling bored and don't know what to do, spend some time. Get to know your family. Look into the word and see who it is that God is as our father. Call people and check up on them. Not just to do a silly TikTok dance, but maybe ask people, how are you? You doing okay? You holding up okay? And as you're feeling down, remember you're invited to the feast of the king. And you're invited to be a part of the family. Feel the hug that the father offers to us. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for the ways in which you invited us in when we had no way. When we didn't know what to do, and we were unable to change our circumstances. When we were dead in our sins and trespasses, you sent Christ to make us new to make us sons and daughters, princes and princesses of the King, and you call us heirs. Thank you for your love, which you show forth in Christ. Help us to continue to get to know our family. Pray us in Christ's name. Amen. Hopefully now y'all are all going to head back to your small groups. Have a good one, guys.